I was asked to talk about psychological therapies and um, uh, there's an article in The Lancet I wrote with Emmanuel Peters and Juliana Oumeri talking about a view from the hills, taking a, a slightly longer term view about where these therapies have got to and really having an idea about um, how research turns into clinical interventions and how important that is to move just from research basis but to actually try and help people in the distress of um, psychosis. As Graham Thormacroft has so um, wonderfully discussed, these problems are extremely unpleasant to have and it's not to be underestimated um, the problems that it causes. I wanted just to um, flag up the Understanding Psychosis and Schizophrenia um, book that came out last year, two years ago, 2016, um, which had a lot of service user content talking about people's experiences and what they wanted us as professionals to do. And I want to focus my talk on the um, importance of um, positive symptoms, which are only part of the picture of psychosis, but are often the most distressing part for the people who experience them and the least understood part from, from their own point of view. And how that's led to um, particular interventions, and I'm only really going to talk about, I'm only going to talk about the CBT, the Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and the Family Intervention Therapy for Psychosis, because those are the ones that I'm expert in, those are the ones that are recommended treatments, and um, those are the ones where I've been doing the research. And finally, just to talk about some of the new interventions for um, very specific and targeted problems, which I think will help to improve the outcomes um, more clearly. Um, interventions on worry, on sleep and voices, and on reasoning, which I'll talk about, and also interventions for carers and the families themselves, who are often um, rather left behind in this. This is a picture by David Marsh, a detail of a painting entitled Imagination from schizophrenic artist paintings out of this world. This is a quote from someone in England who later on became a clinical psychologist, but when he was 18, he, this happened to him. He was sectioned in a psychiatric ward. And when he first went for training to be a clinical psychologist, he did not mention any of this, did not mention his previous mental health history. But he has since, as Graham was talking about, very bravely come out about this, um, is now a clinician himself, and is very vocal on the kinds of issues that you face. And as he says, when he was sectioned on a psychiatric ward, he felt that he'd become a social outcast. And Robbie Murray, headed the Schizophrenia Commission in 2012, calling it the abandoned illness. As we know, it's not unprevalent. There's quite a lot of people are affected by these diagnoses, particularly if you take broad definition of them. It emerges, as we know, between late adolescence and early adulthood. And it's got all these, I don't know if I've got the pointer. Have I got the pointer? Oh, no, that's not the pointer. <laughs> um, is that the pointer? No. Anyway, um, it's got all these problems with unemployment, social discrimination, as has been talked about. Is there a pointer on it? That's going backwards, isn't it? Okay. Oh, point there. No, the pointer. Okay. Oh, that. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and um, the high rates of um, mortality at an, at an earlier age. This is Sue Morgan's Mind Furnace. This is from, the, um, from our local hospital in the, uh, the UK, in South London, the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, which has got, now got an archive of some of the art done by previous inmates. We also know that, particularly in the early years, substance abuse and deliberate self-harm are it raise rates, and there are very high societal costs of care and as I said, although the first line of treatment is medication, many people do not like to take this. It has a lot of side effects and it doesn't work for everybody. And so we have been particularly concerned with the up to 40% of people who remained very distressed, even on medication and without it, um, by their symptomatology and by um, what's happening to them. 
So this um, talk is focusing on them. So the early cognitive models of psychosis made a very particular set of ideas about the importance of appraisals, because being psychologists, we can do something about how you make sense of the world, how you try and take meaning from the huge array of stimuli that come, you come across. And we posited that this leads to recurrence and persistence of these positive symptoms, and that there's a whole range of cognitive, social and emotional processes which contribute to them. This is um, now quite an old article, 2001, 2007, 2006. And as we've heard today by, with Robin Murray, there's obviously the vulnerabilities, there's the dopamine issue, there's the genes. And then on top of that, you're going to get triggered perhaps by something which, and it's your reaction to the trigger, it's the emotional changes, it's the spike in dopamine, it's the upset that that causes. And it's then what you do with it. It's then how you think about it and what you decide. And when you start feeling that what's happening to you is not in your internal, um, your internal stimuli, but it's coming probably from outside that someone is threatening you, is after you, is there's something you worry about, that's when these experiences are turning into positive symptoms. And this is the circuit that we've been very interested to try and change. So. We've heard it's, there's a bit of a disadvantage coming second to last in a conference. Most of, we've done all this, haven't we? Um, there's been um, evidence on the continuum hypothesis, and our group particularly has been interested in the importance of affect. The non-affective psychoses are absolutely brimming with affect. So it's just there. And it's a very helpful thing to know about because that's often the way in and a much less um, stigmatizing way to talk about someone's problems with anxiety or sleep than to talk about their delusions initially. And then a lot of research about the social adversity, and we've heard about this, and the trauma, and bullying and life events, which are contributing to the problems that people have. So just quickly, the continuum hypothesis is now very well evidence, and subclinical and clinical psychotic thoughts and experiences are observable in the general population are not just kept for people who we thought were different from us. And they're very interestingly associated with the same risk factors as the clinical disorder, and that's the etiological continuity. And up to 40% of the population have paranoid ideas about all sorts of things, and these are associated with the same things as in clinical populations, anxiety, perceptual anomalies, worry, and what's called cognitive inflexibility, which I'll talk about a bit later. This is Daniel Freeman's work. We've also, um, there's a whole line of work that he's taken forward about how sleep disorders, if you lack sleep, if you've had insomnia, that makes you much more liable to have delusions and hallucinations. But these symptoms alone are not enough to move you across the threshold. This is um, a paper that Paul Bemington wrote, the distribution of paranoia scores across the total population, the general population with 8,000 um, people. Paul tells me this is one of the most exciting graphs that he's ever made. And as my husband, you do have to worry just a little bit about his excitements, but there we go. Um, and as you can see, what it shows in a very perfect curve, beautiful curve, I do agree, um, is that a few people have lots and lots of problems, and many people have a few problems. And it, that's how it goes across not just the clinical population. And we were hearing about Insel um, a little bit earlier today. Um, even he thinks that there is a dimensional aspect to the classification of, of patients, and that there's many etiological pathways leading to the final mixed bag of behavioral signs and symptoms we label schizophrenia. So we were very interested in affect, and when you start looking at it clinically, when you do use clinical um, measures of the kind of problems that people have when you stop, um, when you're, you don't just look at their hallucinations and delusions, you find that there's all sorts of other things as well. There's high levels of depression. There's at least 30% fit the criteria for previous trauma, panic disorder, obsessional compulsive disorder. And really about half of them have, have comorbid personality disorder. And with that combination, you have very high bed use and very high societal costs. And this is really quite well evidenced now. Um, there's a range of cognitive biases that relate to it, 
and positive symptoms are often related to negative schemas. How you think about yourself um, is going to make you more worried about the world and other people. And it's also related to what happens to you in a family. I'll come back to that. It's also the case that we've got really good evidence now that things like depression can contribute to the later development of delusions, particularly if you have pre-existing perceptual anomalies. And cognitive and emotional related processes are involved in delusional ideation. The um, group in Mayan Gomez have done the um, very detailed work with um, time sampling where you wear a, something on your wrist and it pings randomly about 10 times a day. It's quite irritating when you do this, but um, particularly if you're rushing about trying to get other things done. But um, when you look very closely at the fluctuations in your um, activity levels and what you're thinking about um, and your positive symptoms, it's very, very clear that affect and symptoms are very closely linked. And we showed um, in a paper that, that there's a mediation effect for negative cognitions. And it was a very interesting paper, I thought, by Hafner, talking about the starting point, the trajectory of Tibet depression psychosis having the same initial starts and indistinguishable until the emergence of psychosis symptoms. So these pathways, um, they're not just separate, they're, they're linked to a lot of affect. The, we did a paper with um, Mahwaha, the mood dysregulation. We just asked one question that came from the National Survey. Do you have a lot of sudden mood changes? And that, answering yes to that question, increased the risk. And also, if it, at baseline you had mood instability, significantly you predicted new ideation and auditory hallucinations 18 months later. It's a serious risk factor. We were interested in appraisals, as I said, these appraisals, and there's been quite a lot of work done in physical illnesses. What happens to you if you um, get heart problems or um, cancer? And people like John Wyman talk about the fact that your illness appraisals, how you understand the illness and um, how you react to it, is the key um, predictor of outcome, i.e. whether you'll take treatment, whether you'll change your lifestyle, whether you'll do anything about it. And so we decided to have a look at these in psychosis and of course you get very similar processes going on that if you um, have a negative illness appraisal um, with, in psychosis you're much more likely to be distressed. And if you feel that it's the end of your world um, obviously you're going to feel much worse about it. And Anger is a key mediator of violence in psychosis, so how you feel about um, your delusions and whether who's causing them will often cause you to act on that. And it's also part of why you have safety behaviours. You never want to test out why you're feeling so threatened. So even if the threat has removed itself or it's not relevant anymore, you still won't um, risk going out because you're, you're worrying about things. Reasoning biases. We all have these. You all have them. I have them. It's very common. And i.e. we hold ideas with great conviction that really don't have any evidence. So things like ghosts and telepathy and astrology. Many people read those things. I'm rather embarrassed about this Wired magazine um, quote. But I, I thought initially Wired magazine was a bit of a joke. But it's still, it's still there, isn't it? And, um, you know, people believing in... Um, Aliens, it's very common. And the issue really is that once you hold a view with conviction, you have this confirmatory bias and you don't test alternatives. And particularly with the social media, we all live in a bubble of just talking to our friends who agree with us, reading the newspapers, the media that agrees with us, watching Fox News and not anything else and thinking everybody else is lying. And we just continue that. And so this is nothing to do with just having delusion. We're all jolly good at it. And additionally, if you have psychosis, what you may tend to do as well is you're very quick to make a decision. You're very quick to look at the evidence and say, right, this is what's happening. I know you're all out to get me. I know that part of the audience over there really doesn't like the look of me, and that's really quite worrying. So you're very quick to do this. This is a task from Moritz and Woodward. Now, the, the requirement is, what do you think this is? I'm going to give you some more information. You've got to decide when you think you know what it is. Any, anybody convinced? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there we are. So it's an elephant. Okay, now I won't ask, but if you thought you knew what it was in the first one or two slides, not so good. <laughs> and people with um, psychosis have this um, lack of, this jumping to conclusion, this JTC, and lack of belief flexibility, and are very quick to just use a very small amount of evidence and decide, feel threatened, I feel threatened very quickly, and don't sort of check things out in quite the same way. And at least half people with um, delusional beliefs have this, and it's linked to how convinced you are. And um, very more recently, we found it's related to poor working memory, particularly, but not your overall IQ. And as you know, there's lots of other cognitive processes that are relevant to positive symptoms. Um, talking about salience, as Robin Murray was this morning, um, there's subtle differences in affect and cognition, and how stress can increase the salience of stimuli through a dopamine spurt. And there's also ideas about people's psychosis having self-monitoring problems and not recognising their own thoughts as, um, that thinking that their own thoughts are more external. There's also poor use of contextual, inter contextual information your ability to process what's going on and, and, and take out um, what's salient to you and what really matters rather than what you're worrying about. And there are, of course, working memory and uh, attention problems that don't help any of this. And finally, as we've heard, there's been huge input from adversity. And I don't need to go into this in a lot of detail. We've had a lot of information about all this in urbanicity. James Kirk Bright has talked about um, migration issues very interestingly and making that much clearer what's happening. Um, Graham's talked about the um, perceived disadvantage and um, the problems that people have. We did a little bit of research, which links again to what Graham said, about the the lack of a confidant and how many lonely days a week, even at first episode, people had. How quickly, with someone with psychosis, or someone with psychosis, you just fall out of your social network. Everybody, you will have known someone at school, perhaps two or three people at school, who now have psychosis, but you probably aren't in contact with them because once you get these problems, you don't stay friends with someone. There's also, um, from Marta de Forti, we'd heard about the cannabis risk, particularly with high potency and earlier age of onset, if you do that, and um, all the other things. Right. And there's also all the family work that I've done research with for, in a very long, for a very long time, um, initially with Julian Leff, and finding out that intrusive and negative fam family environments relate to later relapse in psychosis, impede your recovery, particularly if your carers are not very tolerant of you. And this predicts very clearly um, how you'll feel about yourself and um, how difficult it is to get better again. And what we've what we predicted was that particularly family intervention in psychosis need to work through this effective route by calming down the aversive environment by keeping people's ability, by perhaps um, in Robin Murray's words, by normalising the dopamine um, environment and calming things down. And that's exactly what we've tried to do. Just to make a note, we, s we started after a while to just ask the service users if they had a critical relative, which is one question, and it's as nearly as protective as doing a two and a half hour interview, so that's good. That's good. <coughs> And we know about the trauma that's come through very clearly. High rates of traumatic um, events predict onset and associated with CSA and bullying, child sexual abuse and bullying. And I don't know if I've got time to talk about this. How are we doing? How am I doing? OK. Um, and one of the things we've done recently, particularly about bullying, um, with Gidara Catone, and um, this is one of my Italian connections, because I have an Italian daughter-in-law who is called Juicy Moffa, and my son also is involved in this analysis, and Paul Bevington and Gennaro. And what we were interested in doing was trying to use um, a large amount of data, big data, from National Survey to, in using um, Bayesian analysis, a uh, directed acyclic graph analysis to look at the probable pathways between um, an unpleasant event happening to you, probably before you um, had psychosis starting. Bullying is more likely to be like that um, if it's childhood bullying. And using this, this particular analysis to look at the pathway between bully and what happens next and what you find from that. Um, this was national survey data, so about 8,000 um, people in the sample. And what you do is you develop a um, 
probable, uh, this is not easy stuff, you develop probable pathways which look most likely to be um, significantly linked. And so you get nodes and edges and you can, you can draw a pathway. And I don't have the drawing, but um, it's very complicated. You may be glad about that. But what you find is if you start off with bullying and hold that constant, the key issue is, is that it makes you worry. And then that is later leading to paranoid ideas. And that, that is a very key pathway. And we, we're also starting to look at sexual abuse and how it all links together. But you've got these effective routes towards more positive symptoms. And one of the issues is how does this work? And we think it obviously affects your information and emotional processing, affects how easily upset you are, how threatened you feel, and how worried you are about how safe the world is if you've got these kind of problems. Um, and particularly intrusive life events, for instance, are the most difficult things because you feel personally attacked by them. So there's all the work about harsh parenting from the Ausback sample and Helen Fisher and childhood adversity and adult psychosis. And there were some rather specific things about childhood rape with hallucinations. You do, get, you do seem to get a pathway with um, CSA and depression and hallucinations and um, more physical and emotional um, neglect with paranoia. That's Richard Bentle's work. So there is reasonably good evidence for the kind of cognitive models that we've been interested in because, interested in because we were wanting to use these models to apply it clinically to try and help people talk through what they were experiencing. And particularly using the affect route. And what this has turned into, as I'm sure you all know, um, in, the nice, in the latest NICE guideline updates for um, schizophrenia and psychosis and schizophrenia, I chaired the 2009 and the two, 2014 um, guideline updates on this. And there's a very consistent, it's still recommending that CBT for psychosis at least improve symptoms and the family intervention reduces relapse rates so these remain recommended and I was glad to see in this the last um, guideline we looked particularly at what helped carers and there is evidence now that direct interventions for carers because carers won't always come to a family meeting and then they kind of lose out um, they can't always see the point of it and they're exhausted themselves and you can see why it's quite difficult to set these up and so dealing with talking to them directly themselves this is also very helpful and it's not just the uk that's got these support guidelines also recommend these two interventions amongst others and CBT and FI are also recommended for children and young people. And we've done some detailed work looking at how much you need to have, that having more of it means you get a better outcome. So actually engaging people and keeping them in session, which is not, again, easy. Not everybody wants to talk about their problems. Some people just want their problems to go away and hope that they won't come back again. And so engaging them in treatment is particularly crucial. We've got evidence now from early intervention services um, in the UK and of course Mirella Ruggieri's uh, wonderful get up studies with her from the 10 million catchment area in North Italy um, have shown very clearly that um, you can implement these, um, these interventions in a much wider context. And there was a bit of research showing that particularly early intervention in the UK was relating to whether you got these two evidence-based um, interventions and that it was about availability. We've been able to show that after you have CBT for psychosis with Vina Kumari that you can get neural changes, that it changes your brain fairly obviously, i.e. it changes the fact that in the scanner you're afterwards you're less likely to be so upset and react as much to angry and um, neutral faces. And this improvement in your, in your reaction to sort of unpleasant things, they, there was a recent study by Mason showing that the brain connectivity from that was, um, was around eight years later. So there's something about a more permanent change um, if people will engage with this. There's also evidence from the prodomal studies, although the transitional rates are really low, so you can't show it very easily. Um, but CBT can be useful without medication. And Tony Morrison has done a lot of really quite controversial studies about using it without medication and showing this can be can be of help even if you refuse medication and finally there's new interventions which as I say are getting to be much more specific it's a bit like not just 
doing everything you can possibly think of, but trying to target what mechanisms you think are going to be crucial and see if that will help people um, improve faster. So Max Birchwood um, did a trial looking at command hallucinations and improved outcomes, um, reduced the distress and the uh, likelihood that you'd act on them. Um, Daniel Freeman has been discussed about, about um, Paul Beberton talked about this, the WIT trial and the insomnia trials. So he's doing, he's looking at the moderator, he's looking at the, the anxiety from um, insomnia and from worry and dealing it with just with that and that improves, that can also improve your paranoia. <coughs> There's work from uh, Mark Vandenberg talking about um, PTSD treatments and people have been quite worried that you shouldn't talk about trauma directly to someone who's having psychosis symptoms um, because you would upset them too much and he's showing that this is safe and efficacious and also helpful. Um, which is which is nice to know because I when I was working clinically I used to have to if you try to refer someone with psychosis for her trauma the trauma clinic would say no no we won't deal with them they're too upset and so I would end up listening to the trauma and dealing with it and hopefully getting them a bit better it did work and um, we've done some I think this is well I would wouldn't I but I've done some very nice work with Suzanne Jol Jolly um, looking at children with psychotic like experiences which is not psychosis but if you ask even very young children from about 8 to 14 about their experiences if you ask them about it there is a proportion of people who are having distressing psychotic like experiences and they're not so permanent as, as adults they're more transitory but they are coming to clinics and they're asking for help and, and many clinicians don't necessarily know what to do about it so we, we, d we developed a um, a manualized treatment, um, all very child friendly with a lot of service user input, um, which has been shown to be um, acceptable and, um, and useful to people. And one of the key things I thought about this to improve their resilience was to get them to talk about it because none of the children had really told anyone. Or if they had told their parents, their parents didn't know what to do about it. And so if you ask the parents, they say, oh, no, they haven't got anything like that. And the children would say, yes, yes, we have, but we don't know, we don't know what to do about it and we don't like to mention it. So asking very specific, non-sort non of upsetting questions about what's going on and, th and also dealing with it in a normal way. Yeah, oh, really? You know, you're, you're having these problems. You think that if um, nobody looks at you unless, you're, unless the wind changes, so you're always looking out the window. Nobody's going to be your friend unless, you're, unless the wind's changing, and that's going to change your behaviour as a small child and cause all sorts of problems later on. So it's very, I'm very keen on very, very early normal intervention and picking up these problems before they just get set. And then the most recent trial is the Avatar trial with Tom Craig and Philippa Garrity um, did a randomised trial comparing it to... This is the work with avatars where you, um, you turn the voice, you turn your distressing voice into an avatar, into a, an image on the screen, and the therapist helps the avatar become less unpleasant and distressing, and you work with someone to, to kind of normalise that as well. And what they found interesting was that supportive, supportive therapy is still jolly useful, I'm, I'm not entirely pleased to say, but avatar therapy was quicker, got you better faster at 12 weeks, but the other groups caught up. So it's, it's not quite clear how, they, how that's going, but they're going to be doing a lot of moderation analyses to see um, what, the, um, what was changing when and what you could focus on to um, improve that. CBT for psychosis is still controversial. There's still a regular stream of papers saying, no, it doesn't work. It's all nonsense, isn't there, Robin? <laughs> and um, it is quite interesting why people are so worried about the CBT. They don't, we don't get that in the family work. People's not, no, people aren't saying the family work doesn't work, but they, there's a lot of... It, it's very interesting that it's, it's been so attacked. But my view is, to date, there have been 12 meta-analyses, 50 randomised trials. Effect size are small to moderate. That's quite right. And they vary, and it depends how you do it and what out outcomes you use. What we know so far is that it's better if, um, if all else has failed, it's better if it's formulation-based treatments and it can make you kind of feel more in control of things and particularly we're interested just at the minute in targeting the mechanisms and do you remember me talking about the reasoning biases, the elephant? Um, there's a new trial that Philippa Garrity and our colleagues um, have just set up called the Slow Mo Trial because we've um, developed an app, a phone app, to help people between sessions 
and the idea is to be very, very focused on just slowing down your decision making. So when you see a situation that looks worrying, you're asked not to, not to just make a decision about what's going on, but to look for alternative information and slow down your thoughts and think again about what might be going on and see if it's as unpleasant as you think it might be. And one of the key things, I think, for that, it's an eight-week manualised treatment. One of the key things is that you talk about it. It's a computer-based um, intervention. You're talking about it with a therapist on the computer. You've got a phone app that can help, um, help you with your coping when you're out in the street. And the therapists mainly go out in the street with them for at least one session to test out and cement the new thinking. So when you're out in a crowd thinking, oh God, none, nobody likes me, it's all, I've got to hide in a shop, you can actually discuss this and deal with it in the moment. And that behavioural cementing seems particularly helpful for people with these very highly convinced delusions. But we'll see. It's only just started. I think the results will come out in 2019. And... Last but not at all least, caring for the carers, which I've always had a very strong strand of research that I've been interested in and tried to help with this. What we have found out more recently is there's a critical sort of cutoff. More than 10 hours a week care is stressful for any carer. So I don't know how many of you are carers for someone at the moment. 10 hours a week is not very much. And um, if you're the person who's, often carers are on their own, if you're the main person in charge, you, you are more likely to be stressed after 10 hours a week. There's a, there's a step change, it goes right up. And what happens is that while you've got a very helpful role to play in the outcome of psychosis, in reducing isolation, in helping deal with things, talking things through, helping medication, all sorts of things, getting services involved, it's often coming at a cost of your own stress, depression, your grief and your loss. And 90% of carers would like more support. Now the problem is most of them do not want the kind of support that we want to give them. And so you get into a bit of a, an issue about how to help carers who some say, well, I'm too busy and I don't want that and I don't want to talk about it, just sort of, just make him better, you know, just sort it out. And so it's, it's not as easy as you might hope to do this, but problem solving and information support does improve outcomes and any way you can get that through and offer that to carers is extremely helpful. I've tended just to answer people's questions and be available and, and kind of be there to kind of help sort things out. Availability is a huge key thing for them. And there's, a, there's cognitive models now of caregiving about how to really focus on this. And there's, a, there's now quite a call really for self-direction dissemination, allowing carers themselves to give something back and be part of that, of that um, improvement. And many, many carers wish to do that, and there has been some successes in that. And the most, one of the most recent things is, um, I never know what this stands for, m massive online course, whatever the other O is, um, available, which has just been set up at the Institute um, by Juliana Omomeri. And um, that's um, been amalgamating a website that we had before and is up to date, has got all sorts of um, people talking about it. I think probably both you, Graham and Robin, and probably you, um, Marta, I don't, there's lots of people on it. It runs twice a year, it's reached at least 37,000 people um, so far. And it's just a way of giving people the kind of answering the questions, talking to people, destigmatizing in that sense that, that these things happen, there are things you can do about it, and that will, that's continuing. I'd like to finish by, with a quote from, this is an untitled poem by Wendy Baker, who um, came to one of our clinics, the pickup clinic, and talked about what it was like to try and make sense of things, untangling worries of things that might be, controlling and broadcasting all about me, the tills in the shops are a panic alarm, untangling worries which may cause me harm. Mm -hmm.